This man will say anything he needs to to get a clap, to get a vote, to get accolades, a headline, and then the campaign's like, no, 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 no. We start losing votes when we are so pro-life that we kill people. Today, I want to talk about the fact that a lot of people are now contemplating if maybe Donald Trump has changed his stance on abortion or has a different stance on abortion than his compadre, J.D. Vance, and why I don't think that there is a functional difference between their stances, despite maybe them presenting it in different ways. I've seen a lot of conjecture about, oh, has Donald Trump changed his mind? He came to Florida and said, I'm going to say that a six-week abortion is not long enough to think about it. We need more time. He said that, and then immediately his campaign started backtracking on it. So what is his stance? Has he changed it? Is he flip-flopping? What can we expect from him if he is voted into office for another term? I think that the way that we think about this has to come down to what is his track record on this topic. And that is, he told us, I will specifically appoint to the Supreme Court justices who will support overturning Roe v. Wade. And he went on to appoint three, not one, not two, but three Supreme Court justices who all specifically said that would be their goal. They went on to carry out that goal and overturn Roe v. Wade. So we're going to look at some of Trump's comments here and we can speculate on why he does this. Hint, like everything else this man does, I think it's for claps and views and votes. He, I truly think, has no actual stance on anything. He wants accolades. I think it's really important that when you're addressing this as a voter or with your friends and family who are talking about it, to say, like, look, when people tell you who they are with their actions, you should believe them. He told us what he would do. He appointed the people to do it, and it happened. Roe v. Wade overturned at the hands of Donald Trump, despite the fact that that has never been a majority opinion in the U.S. Like, never once in the history of the U.S. has the majority wanted to overturn Roe v. Wade or make abortion access all but impossible for a third of people living in the U.S. So briefly, we will first watch a little CBS News clip. He criticized Florida's six-week six abortion ban. He also said the government or insurance companies should cover the cost of in vitro fertilization. At the same time, the Republican nominee took credit for overturning Roe versus Wade in an exclusive interview with our Caitlin Huey Burns earlier this month. Take a look. So no regrets? No regrets, no. I wouldn't have regrets. Again, I did something that was... Most people felt undoable. Most people felt undoable <laughs> and most people didn't want, okay? We've already reviewed that, right? Never at any point in the history of the USA, particularly when this happened, was a majority of Americans in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade. But as he has told you, no regrets. It shouldn't be in the halls of the federal government. It should be in the state governments. But on one hand, the former president is taking credit for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. On the other hand, he knows that this is a very difficult issue for him and Republicans politically. Okay, so when we talk about this and he says things like, oh, it's a state's issue. There's so many issues with that. Not the least of which being, when you make medical procedures a state's right issue, it opens the door for so many other things to become potentially banned in states. We've talked about this before, right? What about hormone replacement for menopausal patients? What about transgender hormone care? What about your birth control? What if you live in a state where the next thing they do is make your contraception illegal? States rights issue, right? We've got precedent. It also brings into play the need to go across state lines to access particular types of, in this case, procedures or medication. And in the case of menopausal hormone replacement, if that were the next thing they target, getting your hormone replacement, whatever it is, you can't overload one state's system because it's illegal in the other. And that's already what has happened with Roe v. Wade being turned over, right? And then when you start talking about, oh, we're going to ban hormones for transgender people. Well, this is a slippery slope too. What if you are a cis man that needs testosterone replacement? Is it going to be illegal for you too? I don't know. How do you regulate that? Nobody knows. It's a bad idea across the board for so many reasons. And all of those reasons, in my opinion, include the ethics and science behind the reason that they're targeting these things is like a social stance, but there's ethics and science that support access to them. 
even though if you disregard all of that, you still have to grapple with the fact that when you do that, it opens a door for untold and probably unforeseen outcomes that affect many other aspects of care. We already know what all of those are, not all of them, but a lot of them for abortion. But when you start bringing in hormones, there's so many places for that to start coming up as well. So I think this is important, even if you are like morally opposed to some of the things that they are targeting, I still think in that case, it is still exceptionally important to oppose federal or state level blanket legislation that is being put into place to target a single group of people or a single procedure or a single medication because it will have a spreading effect on things that you weren't meaning to target. So if it's not enough to just side with science, side with ethics, side with the medical community, then at least can we decide, oh, this could affect me in a way that I don't know or a person I love in a way that I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't make it a government issue and it should be between a doctor and their patient. Moving on. Trump had said that he was, when he was in Florida speaking, that six weeks was too short. Maybe that people needed longer. Okay. So has he flip-flopped on this topic? The answer to that is no. This man will say anything he needs to, to get a clap, to get a vote, to get accolades, anything, a headline. He just, he just talks to get reactions, right? It's not because he's changed his mind. He has said many times he is in support of a federal abortion ban, and he still believes that. No matter how many times he says it's a states' rights issue, that's not what's going to happen if he gets into office again. And the reason is because his financial backing and his boots on the ground support comes from people who are deeply entrenched into that extremist pro-life side of things. No matter what he says, he's not going to lose their vote and lose their money. That's It's as simple as that. He's getting attacked from conservatives for seeming to backtrack on positions here, but he's also being attacked from the left, of course, who has blamed him for the overturning of Roe and the situation uh, that we now have. I didn't really like that phrasing. We didn't blame him for the overturning of Roe. He uh, took credit for it as he should because He's the one that made it happen. But he did say to NBC that he did not like the six-week ban that is in place in Florida. He said that's too short of a timeline. The the notable thing, too, is that the campaign, uh, shortly afterwards, sent out a statement trying to clarify his remarks, saying, no, he has not made a decision about how he'll vote for the ballot measure. Now, this is all to say that this is reflective of kind of the circumstances that this campaign is now in. It always continuously cracks me up because it's like they can't get a handle on this man like he just goes out and says whatever he wants to say and then the campaign's like no 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 no, guys wait 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 he doesn't understand he doesn't get it he's just he's undecided and trump's like yeah that i uh like i just sometimes find myself sitting around going like i just don't think he's ever actually had a real opinion on anything that he's just like constantly saying whatever he thinks it needs to be to get him where he wants to go like same thing with like the debate and having the mics on or off, you know, Kamala's campaign is like, well, we want the mics on the whole time and Trump doesn't because he's afraid. And then Trump's like, I'm not afraid. I want the mics on the whole time, too. And then his campaign's like, no, 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 <laughs> we don't we don't want to do that. And then Trump's like, yeah, we don't want to do that because those weren't the terms we agreed to, but not because I'm scared to have the mics on the whole time. And then his campaign's like, wow, we are scared of that, actually. Just don't tell him. But yeah, what, what we are afraid of is him having that mic on the whole time because that ain't going to be good for us. Now let's take a look at this. He has held many positions on abortion in his life, right? And what I want you to see as we go through this is that whatever's coming out of his mouth is whatever he needs to be saying in order to support whatever goal he's trying to achieve and get him closer to achieving that. It has very little to do with what he actually believes about anything or what he actually intends to do with any of his positions of power. Because what he intends to do with any of his positions of power is always going to be get votes, get accolades, to have things to brag about. So in October 99, he goes on an NBC News interview and says 
I am so pro-choice. I don't like the idea of abortion, but I do believe in choice. And I am strongly pro-choice. In every aspect as it goes, I just hate it. Okay, February 2011, he goes before the CPAC, which is the Conservative Political Action Committee, and he goes, I'm pro-life, right? Look at the audience here. He wasn't identifying himself as someone who might have a political future in 1999. And that's probably the real stance that he had at the time. But by February 2011, when he's in front of CPAC, no, I'm pro-choice. I'm pro-life now. He said he was against gun control. He wants to end Obamacare, which is fascinating because what's he saying now? All right. He's saying now, Oh, I think I'll make every insurance company cover IVF. Well, you're against Obamacare. And so is the federal government also going to cover IVF? And wouldn't you have to do that through the Obamacare legislation? <laughs> Are we for Obamacare now too? Also, he can't get insurance companies to cover IVF across the board. If you find yourself thinking, maybe I'll vote for him because I need IVF and I can't afford it. That's not going to happen. Don't do it. We'll talk in more detail at some point about why. All right, so CPAC. Yep, now I am pro-life. 2015, he is in an interview with CNN. Again, note your audience. I would look at the good aspects of it. I would also look because I'm sure they do some things properly and good, good for women, and I would look at that. He can't pick a position on if he wants to defund Planned Parenthood because he doesn't hold positions on these things. He just wants to do whatever it is that will further his career. February 2016, now, Less than one year later, yes, actually, I would like to defund federal funding for Planned Parenthood, but I'm also going to say millions of women, cervical cancer, breast cancer, helped by Planned Parenthood. But I would defund them because I'm pro-life. But millions of women are helped by them. Can we see the problem with this, right? So I'm taking an ideologic position. I've decided I'm pro-life because I need the votes. And I'm also going to acknowledge that Planned Parenthood's doing great things for people that I'm not going to otherwise fund elsewhere. And I'm going to take that away. This is a very clear indication that he doesn't care about the overall outcome. March 2016, all right? One month later, he was GOP candidate for president, and he says those who seek abortion should undergo some form of punishment. And he clarified that he means for the person seeking the abortion. When he tells you he supports access, it is not because he does. October, he says to the audience where he is speaking that he will do what he can. I vow to overturn Roe v. Wade and I will put in the number of justices that I need to the Supreme Court to do that. 2017, we've got our first uh, nomination to the Supreme Court. October 2017, we've got a 20-week abortion ban uh, passed with Trump's strong support. January to May of 2018, he was advocating for a national 20-week ban called on the Senate to approve it. And I think, I find this utterly fascinating, if only for the reason of, if we don't want to talk about the ethics, if we don't want to talk about the interference in medical decision-making, if we don't want to talk about the government overstep, can we at least talk about the fact that now, just a mere couple of years later, this is completely a state's rights issue. I just think it's all a state's rights issue. What? what? Really? Was it when you were advocating for a federal 20-week ban? And he continues to advocate for federal bans. So just FYI, he does not think this is a state's rights issue. That is a lie. Brett Kavanaugh comes onto the scene in July of 2018 and Amy Coney Barrett in 2020. All of these people were chosen, hand-selected by him because he knew what they would do with Roe v. Wade. June of 2022, God made the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. So that's the when it happened and Trump told Fox News that God made that decision and he was asked how he felt about playing a role in appointing the three conservative justices who made up the majority in the landmark reversal. I think in the end, this is something that will work out for everybody. He added things. This brings everything back to the states where it has belonged. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I don't really think it's worked out that great for everybody, but could be wrong. And he doesn't actually think it belongs with the states. That's not why he did that. 2022 November, midterm losses. All right, he starts seeing the problem with what he has advocated for. We start losing votes when we are so pro-life that we kill people. He's realizing that. So he comes 
January of 2023 and says, yep, all of these abortion restrictions are why we're losing in the midterms. And he says, it wasn't my fault Republicans didn't live up to expectations in the midterms. It was the abortion issue, poorly handled by many Republicans, especially those that firmly insisted on no exceptions, even in cases of rape, incest, or life of the mother that lost large numbers of voters, all right? This man has no ability to maintain any kind of semblance of cohesiveness or position. It's all about him, right? So he's now going, not my fault. It's the abortion issue. After he vowed to overturn Roe v. Wade, did just that, and then lost a bunch of elections for his party. September 2023, he starts making these weirdly vague comments about compromising on his abortion stance. Why would he do that at that point, might you ask? Could it be because he's planning to run again and he cannot be seen as being quite as extreme as he has been because he noted the losses in the midterms and took that to heart and needs to now waver? So he goes on Meet the Press and he says, let me just tell you what I do. I'm going to come together with all groups. We're going to have something that's acceptable. We had something that was, you know, kind of acceptable. It was called Roe v. Wade. Heard of it? Earlier this year, that state's rights issue that he had talked about. Hmm, <laughs> let's see what he had to say about that. Reports surfaced that he told others he was considering a federal abortion ban at 16 weeks, and his campaign dismissed this as, what do we call it when people say things that we don't like, even though we actually did say them? Oh, we call it fake news. So Len Senator Lindsey Graham tells NBC that he's warming up to 16 weeks and Trump himself in an interview also suggested that he would support a 15 week federal abortion ban. He does not think this is a state's rights issue. April, he won't give a full answer on whether he will vote for or not vote for as a Florida voter the ballot measure in Florida and said that he would talk about it next week. And that next week he says abortion should go back to the states. And he says specifically, my view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, once again, <laughs> it's not where everybody wanted it. Nobody, or at least no majority ever wanted it like this. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both and whatever they decide must be the law of the land. So as you can see, he is not going to protect or backtrack any kind of abortion legislation. When he gets into office, it will be all about maintaining his financial support from the extremist party base that has all the money. And we've gone over where they get this money and how they fund these things in other videos. So I'm not gonna dive into it here, but what I can tell you is that the extremists are where the money comes from and he will keep them happy. So nothing he says along the campaign trail, unless it is in line with what those extremists want, should be taken at face value. <laughs> I'm sorry. There we go. Yep, everything's falling apart. Me, the US, protections for healthcare that people need, it's falling apart. There are probably a million more things that we could talk about with regards to this, but I just wanted to cover the fact that he will maintain the positions that he needs to on the campaign trail and it will continue to be that everywhere he goes, we will see him wavering on this issue and other big issues in accordance to who the audience is. But when he is in power, he will be supporting the things that his funding base, which is the extremist right, wants him to support. It doesn't matter what he has said along the campaign trail, he will be pandering to the people who financially support him, which is the extremist right. You can see that by his picks for Supreme Court justices, by what he did in his last term, by who he chose as his VP candidate, which I now think he's probably regretting because, come on, this has been so comical. I think it's just really important that we get out there, though, that we're going to see him pretending to flip-flop on this a hundred times or skirting the issue or acting like maybe he's more moderate than he is, and that is because He's going to say whatever he needs to say in front of whatever audience he's speaking to or to the larger group of voters in the U.S. who he needs to vote for him in order to get into office. And after that, it's going to be right back to federal bans, anything to make the extremists happy, anything to keep my funding, anything to brag about and have accolades. He's not going to keep any of these random, seemingly more moderate stances that he's tried to take. And I mean, 
his campaign walking it back like that, when he even just said, maybe we need more than six weeks, should be all the evidence you need. They have to immediately send out an email to the base. Wait, 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 no, that's not what he meant. He doesn't mean we need more than six weeks to decide because they cannot risk actually having their base believe that he's not their justice warrior for the pro-life issue. All right, that has been my rant for the day. I will be here, I can assure you, way more frequently than I have been the past eight months, which means if I show up more than none, I've kept my promise. Thank you for being here. You all are the best. Thank you for your support and being so nice to me. See you soon.